Hello, I'm Dr. John Hadley, Chairman of the NAMA Health and Safety Subcommittee. And I'm gonna today spend a few minutes telling you about a remarkable development in our understanding of what makes fibers safe. It is a, a compelling story. It originated out of research, sponsored by the industry over a period over 15, 20 years, at a cost of tens of millions of dollars. Before we get into it, I, I wanna say the way I'm gonna do this talk is I'm gonna give you a little bit of history and background, why it was important. Then we're gonna to have to learn a little bit about the human lung and our respiratory system, because it is that knowledge that allows us then to understand the key role of durability in the safety of fibers. By way of history, it's been known for decades now that asbestos fibers are capable of causing disease in man. It causes three major diseases. One of them is something called asbestos, which is scarring of the lung. Uh, scar is what happens when you get a cut uh, in your hand, it heals up, you get a little white bump in there, and that is scar tissue, which is fine on your skin and holds everything together. However, if it's in your lung, it makes your lung stiff and it makes it very, very difficult to breathe. The next major disease associated with the inhalation of asbestos is lung cancer, primary lung cancer due to the interaction of the fibers in the lung. And then finally, there's a disease, another type of very malignant cancer, which is called mesothelioma. This is a disease that occurs in a very unique type of cell that kind of lines the rib cavity. So it's be, be inside the ribs, but yet outside the lung. And it's only one cell layer thick. So just a tiny layer of cells. But for some reason, Asbestos fibers have a real affinity to attack this layer of cells and develop a deadly type of cancer called mesothelioma. As scientists were studying why this mesothelioma developed, they found that they could inject asbestos fibers into the abdominal cavity of rats where they'd be in close contact with these mesothelial cells, and indeed they would end up developing this mesothelial tumor. Well, so as scientists were understanding that, Back in the early 1970s, a couple of scientific organizations, a couple of laboratories actually, decided to try the same thing with very, very fine glass fibers. So they took some very, very tiny glass fibers, injected them into the abdominal cavity of rats, and they ended up with mesothelial tumors. Now these tumors were the kind that we're also seeing in people when they inhaled asbestos. So there was a lot of concern that maybe glass fibers or insulation wool fibers could have the same effect. So additional research was ongoing, but these findings were so startling. In 1987, the World Health Organization gathered a group of scientists together, of international science, all experts in fibers, to discuss all the available data on the insulation walls and decide what the research was, tell was telling them. They concluded that at that meeting, that rock slag and glass wools were possibly carcinogenic to men. Fast forward 14 years, same organization. They get together a group of 19 scientists. They again study all the data that's available on rock slag and glass wools and unanimously conclude that these materials should be removed from the list of possible carcinogens. What happened? What happened in between 1987 and 2001 was pure science. There was a, a industry collaboration with both the American, the European, the Australians, a pan-industry collaboration to fund research projects that looked at our workers, that looked at, at the exposures of our workers and people who install our products. And what really turned out to be the key was a great series of animal studies and that one series of animal studies alone cost over 40 million US dollars, and this was back in the 1990s. What happened, the research led us to an understanding of a total shift in the way we thought about the, the safety of fibers. And because of this work, now that we understand what controls the safety of fibers, there never has to be another asbestos. In order to understand why the, these two, these different parts came together, First, we have to understand a little bit about the human respiratory system or the human lung. The human lung is an absolutely the respiratory system, whichever you want to call it, is an absolutely fascinating organ system. We breathe, for example, about 17,000 times every single day. We process somewhere between 10 and 25,000 liter 
bottles of air each day. The surface area of the lung, if we were to take the lung and spread it out, it would be the same size as the tennis court. And on that tennis court, winding around are over 1,200 miles of capillaries. And within these capillaries is about 140 milliliters of blood. That's about, about the same as in a, in a glass of red wine. And what's interesting is that the blood and the lung surface are kept apart by a layer of cells, by tissue, that is about a half a micron thick, or about 150 times finer than a human hair, is the only barrier between the blood and the air coming in. When the lung, this surface area of the lung, this is where the alveoli are, and they, they, they are very similar to a, a cluster of grapes. I don't care whether you like green, red, or black grapes, but they look like a cluster of grapes. And this is where the actual air exchange takes place. And each of us has approximately 500 million of these little gas sacs in our lung. When we think about the, the lung, it's useful to consider it in two parts. The upper part, which it considers, which is the nose, the trachea, the larynx, and on down through the bronchi, serves simply as an HVAC system. It conditions and, and warms the air to a nice 37 degrees. But it doesn't do anything with gas exchange. That all occurs down in the alveoli, these 500 million um, alveoli. Now, because we breathe 17,000 times a day on average, each time we breathe, the air around us contains lots and lots of airborne stuff. Some of it is just dust particles, some of it is skin flakes, some of it could be insect parts, could be diesel exhaust, it could just be ran. Sea salt is a very common airborne particle. But it, it's not uncommon for a, a conference room, maybe like the room you're sitting in right now, uh, the air in that room would have about maybe 500 to 1,000 or maybe 5,000 particles per cubic centimeter of air, which is about the size of a sugar cube. So each time you breathe, you're taking down hundreds of thousands or millions of pieces of dirt and debris and spreading them down on the surface of the lung amongst all these alveoli. Now, if there was not a way to vacuum clean that surface of the lung, we would soon fill up, our lungs would fill up, and we would all die because of lack of the ability to exchange oxygen. But the lung has a unique system. It has de developed a system of cells known as alveolar, because they live in the alveoli, macrophages, macro, great phages, eaters. So alveolar macrophages, which live in the lung, um, at any one time, we are all, all of us humans, walk around with about six billion of these fibers walking around that tennis court surface in your lung, and their job is to keep it clean. And since some of the particles we inhale could be bacteria or biological and alive, it's important the macrophages have some way to kill these bacteria, because bacteria multiply like every 20 minutes, and within a couple, of hours, a couple of hours, you'd have a screaming pulmonary infection. So what the macrophages do is they have these little packets inside them of very, very potent, deadly enzymes, deadly to bacteria, which they, when they ingest a, a particle, they'll put the enzymes on them and, and the bacteria will die, and then they will be eventually be brought up the trachea bronchi and swallowed. Now, these enzymes, one, one of them that's really interesting is, is an enzyme called papain, which I'm quite sure you have not heard of, but you may be familiar with it as it is the active ingredient in Adolph's meat tenderizer. That's what's inside all six billion macrophages walking around your lung. So one of the things that one might begin to imagine is I don't want to do something that's going to hurt a bunch of macrophages and dump this poison onto the surface of the lung. It's, and this is the reason why that anything that will da damage the macrophages or allow release of these enzymes can cause chronic lung problems. So we have macrophages and we know they're, they're guarding our lungs we know they're filled with stuff that we don't want to dump out, so we don't want to hurt the macrophages. One of the things that is important and is absolutely unique has to do, remember when we talked about the tracheobronchial tree, is it down in condition in the air? It has one other very unique uh, property in that it filters the air. It filters large particles out and they never get down into the gas exchange areas. It is highly effective at that. In fact, 
any particle that gets down into the lower lung is always smaller than the alveolar macrophages, any particle that gets down. In fact, what we have here is a, an exact replica of an alveolar macrophages, which looks exactly like a dog toy, but it's not. And so we have the macrophages walking around the tennis court of your lung. They come across a small particle. This one appears to be a blue ball of some sort. And they will come up and ingest the ball, where the, and then if the ball does not bother them, if it's a non-toxic ball, they will just eventually, the macrophages will come up and be swallowed. Everything's fine and dandy. If the ball were to be something like crystalline silica, which is very, very toxic to macrophages, the macrophage comes down, he eats the silica, but the silica kills him from inside. So when the cell dies, these enzymes leak all over the surface of the lung, setting up chronic inflammation, and the disease in this case is called silicosis. Now, as we, as we said, every particle that gets down into the lower lung is smaller than a macrophage, except for the fiber shape. Think of the way that arrows fly. Think of the way of javelins fly. Well, fibers fly exactly the same way. So it is possible to get fibers that are many times bigger than an alveolar lung macrophage into the lower lung. The macrophage comes up to the fiber, tries to ingest it, and macrophages are really cool, but they don't have teeth. So as their membrane comes around the edges of the fiber here, they drool. And what are they drooling? those darned enzymes onto the surface of the lung. So if you have enough fibers and they last, the macrophages drool, you set up chronic inflammation, which leads to fibrosis and can lead to cancer. And so that's the weird phenomena about the fiber shape. And you might notice I didn't say what the fiber was made of, because it doesn't matter. The fibers fly like arrows and javelins. So if we look at this, the whole key to this, the problem with fibers, is the dimensions which can be so much longer than a macrophage. The largest particle you can possibly get in your lung, maybe 10 microns. The longest fiber, maybe 200, 250 microns. And macrophages are around 15 to 20. And that is the single most important finding of all this research was this relationship. So if we were to think about what a lung would look like before we took a breath, we could see the alveoli. We could see how the respiratory tract comes down and the clusters of grapes there. And then we would take a breath. And what happens when you take a breath is you get a big influx of hundreds of thousands or millions of pieces of debris all over the surface of the lung. When that happens, the macrophages go to work. And within a relatively short period of time, a week or so maybe, the only thing left in the lung, because we have, when we inhale it, we have short fibers, long fibers, particles. But the macrophages clean up everything except for the long fibers. They can't do it. Now we've got one or two things that are going to happen. If the fibers are soluble in this warm, salty solution, which is our blood serum and lung fluids, they will dissolve and go away. There will be nothing left in the lung, and the lung will be returned to its normal state. If, on the other hand, the fibers are durable, they will accumulate, the macrophages will try and eat them, the macrophages will be damaged and will set up chronic inflammation and disease in the lung. What happens in this whole thing is it is the aerodynamics of the way fibers fly through the air and if these that allow them to get into the lung where if they're durable and at high concentrations, they will lead to disease. And what controls how long these fibers last, how durable they are in the lung, is their composition, what you make them out of. You adjust the composition, you can make them more soluble. And that's what the industry has done over a number of years. In terms of uh, putting this durability in perspective, if we look at the types of asbestos, like the amphiboles, which are the really particularly dangerous and toxic ones, those inhaled into the lower lung uh, would be anticipated to last a one micron long fiber. And microns are really small units of measure. Your hair is about 60 to 80 microns in diameter. A one micron asbestos fiber would be anticipated to last about 25,000 days in humans. And 25,000 days is a little over 68 years. Whereas if you look at the, the rock, slag, and glass insulation walls, those will last 50, 75, 20, maybe 100 days. 
and they're all gone, which is why that rapid removal precludes them from initiating any kind of disease process. Okay, so what are the outcomes of this research? Well, in 2001, 14 years after the 1988 finding that these materials, the rock slag glass wools, may be carcinogenic, the World Health Organization again assembled their experts and again, and this time developed a unanimous position that these materials should not be on their list of possible carcinogens. And this is 180 degrees difference in the scientific consensus between 1988 and 2001. And then in 2011, uh, both the U.S. government and the state of California removed biosoluble glass wools from their list of possible carcinogens, which meant that we're in a situation now where there's no authoritative body in the world that has rock slag or glass insulation wools as a possible carcinogen. And finally, if we, if we want to say, how did this all come about? It was a research sponsored by the industry, the global industry, that was funded and published and communicated widely throughout the scientific community that allowed these authoritative bodies to reconsider the new evidence and remove these, these biosoluble fibers from the list of possible carcinogens. And with that understanding, we now know what it is that dictates the safety of fibers in terms of their durability in the lung, the lung fibers. And because of that knowledge and the fact that the industry has communicated it widely, there never has to be another asbestos. Thank you.